I've seen plenty of amazing indie games with inspiring stories behind their creation. Games made by teams of less than five people, and in some cases only one person that took years of hard work, passion, and even pain to create. Out of every story I've heard, though, Path of the Midnight Sun has probably the most interesting one behind it, because this amazing and lovingly crafted game initially started out as this. Back in 2012, Path of the Midnight Sun started out as an ambitious ROM hack for Fire Emblem The Sacred Stones, simply called Midnight Sun, that the game's creator, Alfred Kamen, worked on until 2017 when development for it was cancelled for a lot of personal reasons. The thought of his creation being half-finished didn't sit quite well with him, though, so after some time he quit his job in 2019 to pursue game development, with him soon forming his team, Studio Diamond. By the way, as a quick side note, if you want to hear more about the story behind this game, check out the interview Fargast did with its creator over on his channel a few years ago. Link will be down in the description. They launched a Kickstarter for it that same year, which raised a little over $34,000. The game's name got a slight rebranding to what it is now, and became its own original IP, complete with an orchestrated soundtrack and even professional voice acting. It was released a little more than three years later in January of 2023 on Steam, and while it did get very positive reviews, it did not get nearly enough attention in my opinion. Like, I can guarantee you that most people watching this right now probably haven't even heard of it before in any capacity. Heck, if I'm gonna be completely honest here, I didn't even know about it until a few weeks ago when I found it on sale. After playing it, I was kinda surprised that something this well written, visually pretty, and mechanically interesting went under the radars of so many. So you know what, let's see if I can't convince those of you who haven't played it yet to give this wonderful passion project of a game the chance it absolutely deserves by explaining why Path of the Midnight Sun is amazing. Path of the Midnight Sun takes place on the continent of Arvium, 60 years after the immortal Demon King was sealed away. The story starts with the first of our two protagonists, Suzaku, a holy knight captain for Pylum, being woken up in a forest by his friend and partner Shiori after he fell unconscious in the middle of a mission, only to find he out of nowhere developed amnesia. Their mission, however, has something to do with them finding Faratros, our second protagonist and the heir to the Hoikade royal throne as well as the current vassal for the Demon King's soul. You see, this isn't like other stories where the big bad was just locked away in a place or artifact for a thousand years. In Path of the Midnight Sun, that wasn't possible, so they instead have to seal the Demon King away and a person over and over again. And this is where these tropes you're noticing by now start getting fairly interesting. The seal placed on Faratros is far from perfect. Learning shadow magic is a requirement for suppressing the Demon King's power, and she also needs to keep her emotions under control because one emotional breakdown could be enough to undo the seal. Heck, making matters worse is that in the 60 years they've been doing this, they've gone through four separate vassals, with Faratros being the only person to make it 21 years as one. The rest were always corrupted and turned evil by the Demon King's power as well as influence before they could ever come close to dying of old age. This makes life for Faratros incredibly stressful, with her having so many responsibilities as both the princess of a kingdom and the current vassal, with the latter causing her some issues after she's believed to have murdered her castle guards in cold blood. Now, in actuality, she killed them in self-defense with the guards having been mysteriously brainwashed, but with previous vassals having a history of going bad, no one believes her when she tries to defend herself, and she ends up having to escape with the help of a mysterious man with dimensional magic named Helios. Now, it's at this point in the video that I should clarify, there are more complexities and little details in the story that I have been skimming over. With Path of the Midnight Sun being equal parts RPG and visual novel, experiencing these other aspects of the story yourself is far more interesting than hearing some dude on the internet tell you about them. So in regards to how I feel about the plot itself, I'll put it like this. While Path of the Midnight Sun does have some tropes you might be tired of, I think it does a pretty good job at making them feel interesting and fresh. This iteration of your usual RPG Demon King might be my favorite because of how well the story handles him. He just feels threatening in a way characters like this normally don't due to his complete immortality, the fact that he could break out pretty easily, all things considered, and that all of the monsters you fight in the game are wild animals he somehow corrupted while he was sealed away. As for Suzaku and his amnesia, while I of course can't say too much about it for obvious reasons, I will say that they make it pretty interesting quickly with how ominous of a tone his frequent visions of the past can get. That being said, while the plot is definitely good, the biggest strength for Path of the Midnight Sun story is easily in its main cast. The party consists of the previously mentioned Suzaku, Shiori, Faratros, and Helios, but we also have the Magnolian Princess Rhea as well as her retainer, Kristoff. And honestly, I kinda love all of these people. Suzaku, aside from how well written he was, had a surprising amount of snark to him, which was fun, but I also loved his relationship with Shiori. On that note, Shiori, along with being a good friend of his, also doubles as a blind priestess who has the ability to sense the emotions of people, and more specifically, anything malicious they might be feeling. 
It's hard to go into why I love their relationship so much without spoiling parts of the story for you, so I'll just say that it's pretty wholesome and even kinda sweet, especially if you romance them like I did. Oh yeah, similar to Fire Emblem, you can actually pair off some of the characters towards the end of the game. If I'm gonna be honest here though, Shiori and Suzaku feel so canon as a pairing, I can't imagine them being with anyone else, and with how limited the options already are, in that there's only six different pairings, I feel like it would have been better to just write Suzaku and Ferratross with only one love interest in mind. On the note of Ferratross though, I really enjoyed the way the game handled her character. She's someone who shoulders a lot of very emotionally taxing responsibilities, and with how much she's put through the ringer over the course of the story, all of the effects this had on her will be plain as day, and it all feels kinda realistic. Which is exactly why I like her friendship with Rhea as much as I do. She's the friend Ferratross needs by her side in this adventure, and for a lot of reasons, she was great at emotionally supporting her when it was necessary. It's also for that reason that I paired them off in a scene I don't actually think I can show you. Not because it's spoilery at all, but because, while nothing too explicit is shown, the scene gets a little spicy, and let me tell you, it becomes pretty clear who tops in this relationship. Helios was a pretty interesting character that also made for a great element of the story. As Helios himself reveals early on, he's Ferratross's secret half-brother, meaning he's pretty much the only blood-related family she has left since her parents died shortly after she was born, and their resulting relationship was pretty wholesome since just like Rhea, he's someone Ferratross kinda needs. As for Kristoff, I mean, honestly, he's just an S-tier himbo. He's funny, a pretty nice guy, and always a joy to have on screen, with him having some of my favorite moments in the game. Frankly, I don't really need to say much more about him than that. Overall, while the actual plot is good, like I've said, these six really make the story as great as it is. Their writing is very, very good, and they all have great chemistry with each other. As a cast of characters, they're incredibly solid. Now, before we move on to the other half of this experience, I want to give a quick mention to the game's presentation, because it's beautifully well done. The artwork for everything and the character designs are all great, but I love Path of the Midnight Sun's usage of live 2D for the character models. It gives so much more life to the party and other characters when they're talking in cutscenes, and it makes everything feel more visually interesting than if they were just still portraits. Frankly, I'd love to see more games like this use live 2D in the future. Also, shout out to these dwarf wolves the game calls Lukoi. As a cringy dog lover, they're some of the most adorable good boys ever, and I would absolutely buy a hundred plushies of them, especially for this middle one right here. Now, with that being said, though, this game is an all-visual novel. It is still 50% RPG at the end of the day, and in that regard, Path of Midnight Sun's probably different than what you're used to. The biggest difference is in how limited your time and resources are. In each chapter of the game, you'll always have one or more goals you'll need to achieve or places you'll have to be at by a certain time of day. Doing things like moving to a new part of the area you're in for the first time, choosing certain dialogue options, and plenty of things related to combat will move ahead the clock a little. As a result of both this and how the game's designed, that means resources like money, items, and materials for crafting are also limited. Generally speaking though, I found that the game gives you plenty of resources to get by if you fight a majority majority of enemies, do side quests, and look for hidden stuff in towns as well as buildings with the help of your adorable doggy friend, Lucos. The same goes for time management. While the idea of having a pseudo time limit to manage may sound a bit scary to some, I personally found that the game gives you more than enough wiggle room. It was never really a problem at all. Now that being said, before we continue on, there are two other things you'll be managing with each character's hunger and sanity meter, but I say managing pretty loosely. The former is exactly what you think it is. Characters have a five apple meter representing how hungry they are, with the rate it depletes varying based on the difficulty level. Even at the second hardest difficulty though, it never depleted fast enough to where it became a problem. I really only needed to eat like once or twice per chapter. The sanity meter though feels entirely unnecessary with the way it was handled. The idea is that certain things in the story or choices you make can either raise or lower a character's sanity, and if it gets too low, it'll cause problems for you. What those are, I couldn't tell you though, because sanity is so easy to manage, it feels kinda pointless. While I think it's an interesting enough idea for connecting the story and player's choices to the gameplay, I'd honestly forget this mechanic is even a thing if it wasn't for the sanity up and down pop-ups. As for the combat though, there's a lot to go over. While there are moments where you'll be immediately dropped into a fight, you'll usually be placed on what the game calls a tactical map first. 
Here you'll move spaces or rest until you use up all of the time for that map's player phase, with the enemies of course going afterwards. Similar to something like Fire Emblem though, you'll have to be careful about the spaces you're landing on. While they can give you an advantage in combat, like lowering the enemy's hit rate, they can just as easily hurt you, like if you're attacked while on a square that reduces the party's speed. As for Path of the Midnight Sun's actual battle system though, I gotta say it's really fun and it also does some fairly interesting things, a couple of which I don't think I've seen done in other turn-based RPGs. Starting with the basics, every party member will be situated in either the front or back row, of which both can have three each, with the back reducing all damage received by 20%, but as a trade-off it also reduces your damage by the same amount. Each character will have to pick their action before they or the other enemies can do anything at all, with their turn being signified by the turn order tracker at the top. Now before I go into the party itself, we have one more important thing with the basics to go over with mana. Unlike basically every other turn-based JRPG in existence, you don't start with max MP at the start of a fight. See, in Path of the Midnight Sun's world, mana can only be generated in combat, so instead of starting with all of your MP, you generate it over the course of the fight, with each character's mana generation stat signifying how much they get each turn. It's an interesting element you'll have to take into account every now and then, since there'll definitely be times where a certain spell will cost more to use than you can generate in one turn. It is important for another reason though, but we'll get to that when it's relevant. Now as for the individual members of the party, I gotta say they're all pretty good with not one of them being bad at all. Suzaku can hit fairly hard and is very useful, but he does take a while to become super interesting combat-wise with him having only his basic attack and one skill for a good while until you get his mana crest, but more on that later. Faratras is interesting in that she's a mage built around the fact that she's almost as slow as a stone snail. She will very rarely go anywhere but dead last or almost dead last in the turn order, but her spells are designed with this in mind. As an example, we have Nerigus, an attack spell that has her guard to protect herself until her turn rolls around. And if she's been hit at all before then, Nerigus will do more damage, and she has tons of other very useful moves just like this. Rhea is pretty simple as far as party members go. She has plenty of elemental arrows she can use, which will do more damage if an enemy's weak to it. Her biggest strength in combat, though, is how she's the second fastest character in the game, which is great for if you need to use a healing item really early in the turn order. Helios is mechanically kind of like an evasion tank, but he also specializes in bleed skills for chip damage. He can boost his evasion with teleportation, but later on you can also do that with Phantom Bond so long as he's in the slot next to or adjacent from Faratros, with the benefit that it also applies regen. Kristoff is a super useful but strange mix of high physical damage and support. He has some of the best healing skills as well as healing output in the game with his prayers, but he also has plenty of hard-hitting physical moves that can debuff enemies. Finally, we have Shiori, who's the party white mage and also serves as the sole user of light magic in the game. She also has the benefit of being the fastest character and will go first in combat 90% of the time. And as a bonus, because she's already blind, she can't actually be affected by the blind status effect. Now there are actually special party members you can bring with you to battle called adjutants, of which four can be brought at a time. These are characters you'll meet as you go through the story, and while they can't be controlled at all, they do have a special action they can perform at the end of a turn and a constant passive bonus. There's like 20 of them, so I can't go over everyone without dragging this out, but I will say that I really love this mechanic. It adds extra layers of strategy to team building, since a lot of the adjutants have super useful passive effects, like with Kelvala reducing the hit rate of normal enemies by 8%, or how Lepto boosts money gained by 40%. All that being said though, each of the core six party members can actually be strengthened outside of level ups, and that's where your mana comes in. See, normally when battle's over, people lose their unused mana, but with Suzaku's mana crest, all of that instead gets stored inside of it for later. Outside of battle, you can spend your leftover mana points to buy active and passive skills as well as upgrade what you already have in the skill tree. This adds a bit more to consider in combat. Do you go for the expensive and hard-hitting spell, or do you use something cheaper to get more points for upgrading? And because the game does let you redistribute any points you put into that character whenever you want, this gives you tons of free reign over everyone's growth. As a whole, I love the gameplay in Path of the Midnight Sun. Its combat is fun and challenging while also being pretty unique with its mana system and the adjutants. Honestly, I don't have any other larger complaints for the game, aside from one. Now, Path of the Midnight Sun on its default difficulty can be kinda hard, but 98% of the time it's not so difficult you'll be dying constantly at all. There are, however, four moments in the game that massively spike in difficulty, two of which I can't actually show you because they're the last two fights in the game. The first moment is the fight with the Squin King, and the second is Chapter 10's normal enemy encounters. 
The problem here is functionally the same in that both moments aren't something you'll be initially prepared to deal with for one reason or another. The Squin King and his cronies are very tanky and hit really hard, with the King being capable of hitting you for upwards of over 2,000 damage if his attack isn't lowered. And for context, your party's HP likely isn't going to be much higher than 3,000 by this point in the game. Chapter 10 honestly wouldn't be too bad if not for these frustratingly adorable moths. The normal enemies, while they can hit hard and drain your MP, aren't too bad thanks to how squishy they are. The moths, though, are here to fix that by automatically putting up wide guard at the start of battle until they die, which reduces all damage for enemies in that row by a whopping 75%. This makes every fight in the chapter take longer than it otherwise should, especially in a game where an enemy unit can have two to three waves worth of fights. Combine that with the enemy's damage output as well as the previously mentioned mana drain and it makes dying very easy if you don't come in prepared. While these two parts of the game took me a while, especially chapter 10, looking back on it, there were absolutely plenty of things I could have done to make things easier for myself going in. But that's sort of the point. The problem isn't the actual difficulty, it's that with how the vast majority of the game is designed, you won't be ready for these moments at all if you're going in blind, because nothing else in the game compares to these four moments in the slightest. Like I've said before though, this is just on the normal difficulty. The game has two easier ones that you can swap to at any time if you'd rather not deal with this or if you just want an easier experience overall. If you aren't one for harder games or if you just want to focus more on the story, you'll definitely have a better experience cranking things down a notch or two. And as for anyone who wants to play this game in hard mode, I sincerely hope you enjoy Pain because I personally can't imagine doing that myself. So if I haven't made this clear enough already, I absolutely love Path of the Midnight Sun, and there's so much more to praise that I just can't talk about here. This game is an amazing passion project that totally deserves more attention than what it's gotten, which is why I really want to encourage you all to consider playing this game for yourselves in the future. The story as a whole is great, with some really fantastic character writing. And even if visual novels aren't your thing, it's such a perfect blend of story and gameplay segments that I'm sure you might still enjoy playing it. For $20, you're getting an absolutely spectacular turn-based RPG that's totally worth the money. But hey, if none of what I just said convinced you, they actually referenced JoJo's Oh So You're Approaching Me scene, so Path of the Midnight Sun's also pretty cultured. Thank you all for watching, like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and I hope you all have a nice day.